Jesus in My Life, episode 64. I like to emphasize to people that, young musicians, that music is not the ministry. You say, I'm in the music ministry. Well, what is that? You're in the ministry of using music to convey the gospel or to convey a message. Welcome to Jesus in My Life, a podcast with Rob and Jack, where we interview everyday people like me and you about their extraordinary experiences with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to Jesus in My Life. This is Jack with my co-host, Rob. Hi, everyone. We're so glad to be with you today. Well, I want to introduce everybody to our guest today, Chuck yeah. Gerard. He's a singer, songwriter, worship leader, and most famously known as a co-founder of the Christian rock band Love Song, which is actually one of the first rock bands in the United States that's Christian. His band actually made an appearance in the movie Jesus Revolution, and we're excited to have you on the show today. Chuck, welcome. My pleasure to be welcome. here. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So, Chuck, we kind of just love to hit the ground running, mm-hmm. okay? And so before we get into how God used you in the band Love Song, could you tell us a little short version of who you were before that and where where you found Jesus? Yeah, a little testimony, as we call it. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, I was born in L.A., and, I, and um, I, was, I kind of rejected all that when I was about 15, and I went off to, um, I wanted to be in a vocal group. We weren't really, it wasn't really not band centric in those days. We were all listening to doo wop and we were listening to these great vocal groups. So I put a little group together in high school and we were called the Castells, right? And uh, I went to Santa Rosa, California High School. And um, we got a record contract. We went down to Hollywood. We didn't cut a whole album at that time, we just were cutting singles. And two of our singles charted in 60 and 61, 20 and above. I don't think they made the top 10, but they made. In fact, I know they didn't. They were in the 20s. But it gave you a taste of, oh, our record's on the radio and yeah, we're on the charts. Sure. So that kind of, uh, that didn't last long. Uh, we were together for a couple of years and we didn't get any more hits. And so we kind of went our separate ways. But I had met at this time a guy named Gary Usher. And Gary had co-written a big song. He was hanging with Brian Wilson. And he co-written the song In My Room with Brian Wilson. And I met him at what we called Sock Hops, which is where... Dances were held in gyms, and kids would have to come in, take their shoes off, and dance in their socks. But the artists that were on the radio would appear in the flesh, but we would only lip sync. It wasn't even a a real, like a background track. You would just sing with your lead vocal. At this event, I met Gary Usher, who had just put out a little, maybe one of the first Hot Rod records called uh, RPM by the Four Speeds. It was a Gotta get, I gotta get, I gotta get my RPMs. Wine, you know, one of those. <laughs> and he was just starting to do that kind of music. And he said, you know, I like your voice. Do you want to make some extra money? And I, you know, just do studio work. And I said, well, I'm under contract with the Castells. I don't want to get in trouble. He said, well, Brian Wilson's even doing it. You know, he's working with Jan and Dean. He says, nobody's calling him out. So I think you're safe. And so... I I decided to try it, and so I did some backgrounds. I think the first session I did was with something for Dick Dale called Super Stocks, I think. When I say I think, I've researched this, and I'm not even sure that I'm on some of the songs, but because they all came out in different compilations. So anyhow, but that was my first recording experience. And then I went on and did uh, a bunch of stuff with Gary, and one of the songs, what we would do is we'd go in and we'd make the record, and then we'd deliver it. And that was the last we saw of it because they hardly ever made the charts or, you know, whatever happened to them, they yep. got lost in the woodwork until later on when collectors started to um, put them together compilations. So um, I'm driving down the street. I lived in Pasadena, California, and I hear this song come on the radio. And I, it's familiar. And I thought, I know that track. That's, that's the Beach Boys. And all of a sudden I realized it's me singing. No. And they had oh, taken wow. one, of our, one of our songs, became a single. They had called the group The Hondells. And the song was called Little Honda. And some of the older folks will remember, uh, first gear, it's all right. Second gear, you lean right. And it was one of the first motorcycle songs. It was about oh. Little Honda. 
So we had this hit, right? So I did that for about four years, and we did all kinds of crazy. Um, I mean, we did slot car album for Ravel Company. We did um, roller skate album, maybe. You know, we'd do anything. And we did a monster album that's actually pretty good. It's called uh, By the Ghouls. And we had little spinoffs on, you know, like big Weird Al kind of yeah. things, treatments, yeah, yeah, but sure. little old lady from Transylvania and blood, <laughs> and, blood and butter, you know, stuff. And... Um, so we had a lot of fun in the studio, and then that burned out. You know, hippies came in, Beatles came in, and changed the whole landscape. Now, guys like our group of, of studio singers, people didn't want records like that anymore, record companies. They were looking for the self-contained bands, you know, because the Beatles had been such a success. So I found myself out of a job, so to speak, and put together a lot of bar bands, and we went and played Vegas and played circuits, different places, um, that's what I did for a couple of years before becoming a Christian. I was in that season. That's when I played in Las Vegas. We had met this band called Mirror of Karma. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? wow. And one of the guys looked uncannily like George Harrison. So we were drawn to this guy. Oh, this guy looks like a Beatle man. Yeah. And they were into LSD. And I had never taken any drug but dr alcohol at that point. Oh, actually, I, by this time, I actually had my first joint, and I'd smoked some weed for a while. But he gave me a tab of acid, and that was my first acid trip. And that, I mean, there's things that are not good for you that change your life, right? Yep. You, can, yeah. you can get arrested and thrown in jail, and it changes yeah. your life. So I'm not putting any endorsement on this, but all of a sudden I was escorted into this idea that, man, there is a spiritual world beyond us. Yep. Yeah. So I became a hippie for about three years, and, and a serious one. During this period of time, there was a band that, that we played with at the Pussycat Go Go in, in Las Vegas, which was the name of the club, kind of a disco club. And there was a band called the Fifth Cavalry. One of the members of that band was Denny Carell, who later on went on to make Christian records, and a guy named Virgil Beckham, who is also kind of prominent in the Christian music scene. And so we followed the guys to Orange County, which is where they played in a really cool club in those days called Gold Street, which was non-alcoholic. It was a teenage club, and his fa Harvey Belisle owned it. It was one of the band members' fathers owned it. Okay. And so we would go down there and hang and watch the Fifth Cavalry because they were an astonishing band. They were really good. They did covers, but they did sure. yeah. an amazing job. They'd change them a little bit, you know, yeah. make them their own. Yeah. So through that, I met Jay Truex, who was also hanging down there, who became the bass player for Love Song. And then we went off, met, he knew this guy named George Grenier, who I just reconnected with posthumously. His daughter emailed me. We were wondering what happened to George. This 50 years plus. George had passed, but only like a couple of months ago. And the daughter got a hold of me, and she sent us some pictures. I mean, it was amazing, because we needed those for our documentary, which I'll talk about in a minute. So anyhow, George was our kind of guru, and he got us into the Bible, and we would do Bible studies up at his house, and he decided, because we were all kind of off on weird doctrine, you have to realize, he thought the um, New Jerusalem was going to be on the island of Kauai, oh, so wow. we all have to move to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. It's a small island. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so we moved to Hawaii, and we lived off the land for a oh, while. You can't really do that. You, know, yeah, you wind right. up making oatmeal, you know, because you can't really, <laughs> you can't live off passion fruit and right. <laughs> avocados forever. But uh, so that was, you know, we went there, then we wound up in, it's a long, too long of a story. It's, it's all in my book. My bio is out called Rock and Roll Preacher, and all of these stories are in my bio in great detail. So this whole journey of the hippie season is in there uh, in great detail. If you're interested in this, go to Amazon.com and get Ch Rock and Roll Preacher by Chuck Gerard. So we, um, we had moved around. Jay Truax started a band in Salt Lake City. The really long story made short. They, they had formed a band. They were on their way to Canada. Their car broke down. They went to a Canned Heat concert and got in through backstage and found out that the opening band was not able to come. They were a band, and they had all their equipment in the car because they were going to Canada. And so they brought their equipment in, wow. played for, uh, in front of Canned Heat on the moment. I mean, yeah, where does this yeah, ever happen? Yeah, they didn't even right. have an audition. Yeah. And they were so well-received that a local Salt Lake City agency signed them. And so they stayed in Salt Lake, and they opened for the biggest names, Creedence Clearwater and Janis Joplin, oh, wow. Three Dog Night, yeah. for a number of years. Well, they wanted to maybe add me. So one day I'm sitting in Hawaii, and I'm just tootling along on my guitar. I see this figure coming down the beach, and uh, who's that? And it's Jay, right? Yeah. 
So we didn't have cell phones in those days. Right. Nobody, he just came to find me. And where do the hippies hang out? North Beach or whatever. So he invited me to come back to Salt Lake City and um, try to join their band, which was called Spirit of Creation. And it was a great band. They were kind of a cream power trio. But it was uncanny. They were such great musicians. I didn't fit in. I wasn't a good enough musician. So I left Salt Lake City and came back to Southern California. And we landed in Laguna Beach. And we were able to rent this amazing house in Laguna Beach. Well, it wasn't amazing in the sense the house was so great, but it was overlooking the beautiful view of the ocean. Wow. And I'm at a little hill up in the back with a little tree that you could sit with your guitar and play, um, you know, play music and look at the ocean. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we had made a little mini commune out of it. There's about six to eight guys living in there. By this time, we were kind of in a desperate place. You know, it looked idyllic, but after going to Hawaii, Salt Lake City, and winding up at Laguna Beach, the Lord had his hand on us, and it was time to lower the net. And so yeah. several of us had already, we'd played in this little club in, in Costa Mesa, and I got arrested. I spent a day in Orange County Jail. They had so many hippies getting arrested for weed and stuff, they didn't have a place to put them, so they give you a one-day jail sentence. It was yeah. a slap on the hand, but I, I, it was enough to... Make me know I never wanted to go to jail. So anyhow, uh, we were all kind of in desperate places, and we were living in this beautiful home, but we didn't know where to go from here. You know, it was kind of what John Lennon wrote, the dream is over, and that's how it felt for us. Yeah. You know? Where do we go from here? And then we started to hear, uh, we would always pick up hitchhikers along Pacific Coast Highway, mainly to get free drugs. You know, you'd pick them up, and they'd have a bag of weed and give you a free joint. Mm -hmm. And... Um, now we're picking up these kids and they're saying, uh, hey, we, you know, have you guys know Jesus? We found Jesus. And we'd say, well, we're looking for Jesus. Where did you find him? <laughs> and Calvary Chapel kept coming up. Calvary Chapel, Calvary yeah. Chapel, Calvary. And so we thought, wow, there's something going on at Calvary Chapel, you know. Uh, we need to go up there and see what's going on. But in the meantime, we're living in Laguna Beach in the house, and we would have Bible studies on the influence of whatever drug. I think at that time I was done with LSD. It's a, it's a very powerful story that's in my book about what got me out of LSD. I, I had a really bad trip, and I swore it off forever, and I stayed off Good. it. Yeah. But we were still doing some hashish, and we'd, yeah. we'd have Bible studies. And I used to go up behind the house on this hill, and I'd take my guitar and I would kind of sing, I call it free singing, but it was kind of a version of tongues, babbling yeah. on where you were free not to worry about rhyming words and yeah. all that stuff. And uh, I did it two times mainly that I remember because both times it drew this awesome darkness. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know a thing about demons. I didn't know a thing about the spiritual side of things. I just yep. knew that this was how, and I, it was weird. It would almost engulf me. And then I just stop. And, okay, this is no good. I'm going to the house. Yeah. And I did it another time, and it happened again. So I was not into that, you know. And so one night we're having a stone Bible study, <laughs> and uh, we're reading about tongues in the Bible. And I'm going, why is that in the Bible? I did that. That's not good. Yeah. This, yeah. You know? So we had different opinions. And so we said, well, there's a Christian house down the road. It was called the Blue Top. And it was a motel complex that I think, Calvary Chapel had rented. I've heard different stories. It was an escrow. I don't know what it was, but they had use of it for a while. And they made a Christian commune out of it. And Lonnie Frisbee was the elder in that commune, in that little hotel. So we knew about them. And we considered them to be real Christians. Not that we were fake Christians, but yep. we, were, we weren't uh, completed Christians, as yeah, they say, yeah. completed Jews, you know? Yep. Yeah. If you ask me what my religion was at that point, it's, well, I'm mostly Christian. You know? <laughs> <laughs> mostly, but you yeah. can't be mostly Christian yep. anymore. You can be mostly married. You know, right. you either are or you aren't. But that's not how we saw it. But we knew these guys were invested. They were they were in. So we said, well, let's go down and see what they think about this doctrine of tongues. So we, it was about 15 miles from Laguna to Newport, and we went up just Unit 1. We didn't know anybody. there. We didn't know Lonnie at this time. Other than, I think, no, we hadn't even seen Lonnie yet. So we go up to the number one, and we knock on the door, and uh, this hippie, wide-eyed hippie, opens the door, and he's, you know, you don't know what he was thinking. He opens the door, and there's five stone hippies on this, uh, you know, on the, on the stoop with Bible in their hands saying, can you guys tell us what tongues is about? So I don't remember actually talking about tongues that night. They just loved on us. They just, you know, they would tell us about their pastor, how they loved him. And he was a 
just such a love guy, and Chuck Smith was, you know, and they said, you guys need to come up and check out the church. Well, I was wary of Christianity. I had this bad experience as a Catholic kid, and they would tell me if I was going to hell if I ate meat on Friday. And, mm-hmm. and I thought, well, if I'm going to hell, I'm going to go to hell with some whiskey and women. I'm not yep. going to go to hell for meat on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> so I, that was really truly how I felt. Yeah. And uh, so I didn't really want Christianity, but this was pretty, you know, interesting. Yeah. And it sounded different. So one night I decided to go up there and Calvary in those days was in kind of a a field of vineyards. It truly was kind of a little country church in the middle of a big city, though. It was in Santa Ana, but it was kind of a little rurally looking area. Wasn't a lot of buildings and stuff at that point, but it was probably a mile around the block. And I must have gone around that block five times. Each time I come around, I go, no, go in, go in. No, no, I don't know. Wow. And I go around again. Finally, the uh, fifth time or so, I thought, okay, you got to do this. This is the night. You got to get this over with. So I pulled in, just almost forced myself to park. Okay, get out and go in the church. So I did. Wow. I sat in the back row and I didn't know what to expect. I don't know if I'd heard about Lonnie yet. Seems like I wanted, I was wanting Lonnie. I think I'd heard about him. By the, yeah, we had heard about him because we'd seen those hippies at the hotel, at the motel and yeah, so I knew about him. I'm not sure I'd met him. So I walked in, and it's not Lonnie. It's Chuck. And I'm going, oh, how disappointing. I wanted the hippie guy. But I sat in the back row so that I could make my escape if I needed to. The Lord had a different idea. First thing that happened was I often tell people I got saved on worship because I felt such a presence in that room yes. that yeah. after even 500 LSD trips that I'd taken, I'd never seen power like that or felt power like there was yeah, in that girl. room. And I knew something was up. I didn't know, you know, this is too weird. There's such, these are kids singing, you know, these simple little choruses. And I was kind of a musical snob. I like Pink Floyd and that kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, why am I so deeply affected by these little folk songs these guys are singing, you know? And I didn't know about the anointing or the power of God or anything, but it just started to burrow into my heart. And then uh, I just... I had an epiphany on the back row there. I don't know what people thought around me. I was literally laughing and crying, and I had snot coming down out of my onto my beard, and I just didn't care, you know. And yeah. again, um, at this point, coming out of the hippie scene, my doctrine, if you will, was kind of a new age one hundred and one doctrine yeah. about we're all part of the fabric of the universe, you know, uh, all humans. And so I had this feeling that uh, you know the John Lennon idea: I am in you, and you're in me, and we are all together, goo 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 right? So I felt like everybody had to get their self together. Mm. And when the world finally, all people got, you know, how impossible, that's not yeah, going to happen, yeah. got themselves together, then the universe would be perfect, or the world would be perfected, and humanity would be whatever, go on to Nirvana or Satori or whatever. So this was an intuitive thing that happened. It wasn't really like the Holy Spirit saying ABC. It was like, kind of a, a cosmic knowing, and I hate to use the word cosmic in co- Christian context because it usually means something else, but a, a supernatural is a better word, just knowing, and it was like, okay, it isn't a fabric. It's not everybody getting together on their own steam. This is one-on-one. I have to get right with mm-hmm. God, mm-hmm. and I intuitively knew that, and so I didn't. I don't remember confessing my sins or repenting or anything like that, but kind of there was in my heart that I realized the things I'd done, and and I surrendered my life to the Lord the best I knew how that night, but it was powerful. It was a powerful experience of just God's love flooding me and uh, taking this great burden. You mentioned in our private conversation before we started this burden, and there was a burden that lifted off me like a big weight wow. came off me, and I realized I was free, and I was just weeping and laughing, and it just felt so great. And I didn't go to the altar that night, but what I said to God was, I said, okay, I don't know if I can make deals with you, but here's the deal. I felt led by the Holy Spirit through the whole hippie thing, felt that the Spirit was leading me to whatever the ultimate truth was. And I said, you've got, there was already things that I personally eliminated from my studies, you know, a certain, let's just say maybe an Eastern philosophy where I said, no, it's too much like levels and achievements and nobody ever makes to the top of the video game you know to win the game (laughs) that doesn't seem right yeah so i would abandon that but i always had this thread of the catholic in me uh, uh, jesus had to be involved somehow so i i told the the lord i said i'm here 
I'll be here committed 100% until you tell me different. And that was 53 years ago. And I never looked back. Awesome. Wow. And uh, never had to look back. Yeah. Because yeah. But by that time then, Love Song was, you know, again, assumed into ministry. And we started to minister there. And it- so you have to talk about that. So you get saved. you are still got your band members that you're hanging out with. And you guys are baby Christians. How does Love Song form out of that? Yeah, yeah that's good. Well, we were Love Song before. Secularly, okay. when we lived, what happened in Salt Lake City, Jay's bands for some reason broke up despite their great success. And so Jay and John, who were the drummer, and John Mailer, who was Love Song's first drummer and well, only drummer, and Jay came and joined our band, which we'd been started to play. We being a group of hippies from Salt Lake City, that some of them that had come from LA that we knew. We played at this place called the Old Mill, and the uh, Jay's band had been there too. In fact, they were kind of the house man for a while. It was a big old, some kind of a mill. I don't know what kind of mill it was, but it looked like an old castle inside, rock walls and then the psychedelic lights and all that. So we started playing there, and when their band broke up, they came and joined our band. Well, at this point, we called ourselves Love Song. But we had never played as, we weren't Christians yet, yeah, so we right. never had a Christian version. So here's how the band kind of came together. We were... Actually, real quick, how did the rest of your band members get saved? Did, where, and where were you at in the dominoes falling towards right. Christ? Yeah. Well, we were playing at the happening. Enter Tommy Coombs and Fred Field, who was our first guitar player. They had just gotten out of the Army, and I think Chuck Butler, he was later in Parable, the band called Parable. Okay. They'd heard about our band playing at Costa Mesa, so they came down to see us. And for some reason, Jay came down. from. He was still living in Salt Lake City, so... We met each other there for the first time. We weren't Christians yet at that point. So then after that, we kind of collected together and we did the communal thing. We did it some in Salt Lake and we did it. We wound up in the Laguna Beach thing. And the key members of Love Song all had a born again experience within about three weeks of each other. It was just God's providence. Fred picked up a track from what I heard, went up to Melody Land and got saved. And the, some of them got saved at Calvary and I got saved at Calvary. So there was like a God-picked group of us. Not everybody became a Christian, you know. So some of the guys were still living with us, but they weren't sure. committed like we were. So we became the nucleus of the man at that point. All right. So you guys have become Christians. How did you guys get to start playing at Calvary Chapel, especially considering that you guys were baby Christians? Yeah. Well, enter the movie now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? So... uh Let's talk about the Jesus Revolution, which was a great honor to be uh, portrayed in that movie. Uh, the Irwin brothers who who put the movie together have always been very respectful of our position in Christian music. And they're knowledgeable about it, which a lot of people are not, because we were not a band that was together for a long time. We made two albums and a live album, but our influence was, our impact was extreme. So in the movie... Uh, what happens is the Lonnie character comes in and he says, I met the, oh, he's talking to Chuck. He comes into Chuck's house and he says to Chuck, I met, met these guys in a coffee shop and we're in the living room and the band that's representing us is playing since I opened up the door. Well, that was all fictionalized. What really happened was we had been going to Calvary for about three weeks and we loved to see Lonnie because we loved that he looked like Jesus and he sounded like Jesus would sound. And we thought, well, we look like Pink Floyd and we have this music we've been writing about Jesus. Maybe the pastor would be a good fit. Maybe the pastor would let us play. So we went into the office on a weekday and uh, it was a Wednesday and went up to the secretary and we didn't have to tell her we were hippies. Uh, but we said, you know, we're a band and we've got these songs about the Lord and we think that we'd like to play here if Chuck would let us. So Pastor Chuck took us out to the sanctuary and kind of interviewed us. It was kind of a little bit patronizing in a way, but, yeah, it yeah. Felt, but he would never really do that. But it just felt a little dismissive, you know, let's get this over with. And But at the end of that, he asked us to play a song. So we played this song called Welcome Back, which didn't relate to him really lyrically because it's about backsliding, come back to the Lord, but the, the anointing fell. Yeah. And he felt the anointing on the music. And I think he felt the Lord saying, push the button on these guys. So the next thing we heard was, can you guys play tonight? It's youth night and Lonnie's preaching. So like our dream came true yeah. all in that, that right there wow. in, in that uh, audition. So we played that night 
I mean, we really had, it was funny. We said, uh, is the meeting at seven? Like, yeah, well, Fred's doing weekends in Orange County Jail, but he gets out at six, so I think we can make it. So we had to go to the jail. <laughs> <clears throat> we had to go to the jail. We had to gather his guitar and stuff and pick him up. He didn't know what was going on. He gets out of jail, and he's whisked to Calvary Chapel, and we that played for the first time. In fact, I don't think we played with drums that night. I don't know where John was. <laughs> but... Um, it was the beginning of this exponential growth for Calvary. The, yeah. the place grew from 200 to 2,000 in about four months' time. That's so crazy. And that's the reason in the movie they have that white tent. Well, it yeah. actually wasn't white in real life. It was more like an olive drab kind of uh, uh, military-looking tent. But it was a circus kind of tent that held 2,000. And we had to ha have services in there for a couple of years till they built the sanctuary, yeah. which was built, by the way, brick by brick. Chuck never went in debt, Pastor Chuck. Mm. He would take offerings and put a few bricks in the wall, you know, so to speak, until it was done. So when they moved into that <clears throat> new sanctuary, it was paid for. That's awesome. Wow. So we um, we were part of all that in this exponent. Part of the reason I think that um, a lot of people, even the movie suggests that, you know, Kelsey Grammer says something is, uh, she said, well, the, uh, the movement that started or something like that started here is spreading. Yeah. Well, it didn't start there. It started a lot of other places. There sure. were undercurrents. Jack Sparks up in Berkeley and Ted Wise, the intellectuals that later yeah. on yeah. became the Christians of the intellectual world. And so it was happening there. It was happening in New York with Freeville, with Scott Ross, who recently passed. He was a DJ that became famous as a Christian. He was on 700 Club for a while. Some people okay. were, wow. he did interviews for 700 Club. And he was married to a Ronette, if some people were, be my baby. And so there were things happening other places that converged on Calvary Chapel. What happened there that what made Calvary important was the media got a hold of it mm -hmm. there. Uh -huh. And they saw that there's this newsworthy thing with all these hippie kids that everybody was wondering what was going to happen with the hippies anyhow were getting saved. And so they would send reporters, they'd send film crews down to record or to do interviews. And so our band would be usually the band that was playing. So we would be in the article in Life Mag in Newsweek. And so our band profile rose very quickly. We were exponentially, we were well known throughout the nations, not so much the world yet, but the nation. So that began the whole public awareness of this thing that began to be branded the Jesus movement. Now, in the movie, they called it the Jesus Revolution. I don't really know why they changed the name, but it's okay that they did. But we called it the Jesus movement. The real history of it was it started to branch out and become a national thing. Love Song never played outside of the U.S. except for Canada, maybe once. We, we went to Vancouver and played... And it was a shocker because we had always had these altar calls we were talking about where you had 50, 60 percent of the audience coming to the front. We give an altar call in Vancouver and it was like dead. Nobody walked wow. in. And we're kind of going like, what did we do? Did we say something wrong? Yeah. <laughs> well, what we didn't realize, it wasn't their time yet. Yeah. Because four yeah. years later, there's this little church called St. Anne's or something in Vancouver. Bob Birch became the, the Chuck Smith of Canada. And they had a little mini version of the Jesus movement up there, but it, it wasn't their season yet. Yes. And then worldwide, I don't know that I'd say there was a Jesus movement worldwide. What happened worldwide when I first started going to Europe was they were into the new music by then. And you'd pack out these little old Gothic churches where you couldn't even really play rock and roll in there because yeah, yeah. it was so echoey. But yeah. Kids were hanging from the rafters. They came from the music, though. It was, yeah, And yeah. I think there was a, a spiritual side of it as well. Sure. But the unrealized, I think, by most people is that the, what we call the Jesus movement was primarily an American phenomenon. Yes. Yeah. It did yeah. reach the world. It did affect the world. But it was huge. And it, it was like some people like to diminish its importance as a, a revival. But for me, it was a, a genuine, re, it, whatever you call a revival, mm -hmm. it was a genuine awakening yeah. of the church. And it's remarkable how many people have stayed all these years. You go on Facebook all these people that have been Christian for 50, 60 years. And I like to use the little story. I can go somewhere. I have gone to these places like Fort McMurray in Canada, which is so far north. People say, what are you doing up here? Nobody comes up here. <laughs> and we do a little meeting in a church and yeah. be packed out. Or, uh, you know, the the bush out back in, in, in Australia with 30 yep. people. And 10 of them are lip syncing my songs. Wow. wow. Because they know it. So yeah. you exponentially what that means is that 
many people from that era are still Christian. Yes. That's still wow. part of the DNA of their life are those songs. Chuck, Chuck I want to hone in on something here because sure. I, it seems like something I want to unpack with you. Because you mentioned the power of music, maybe not directly, the spiritual power of music before you were a Christian, right? Like literally you, you had a demonic experience in music and through music, you got saved, yep. right? Mm-hmm. So could you unpack that for me? What, do you, what is it about music that God uses? It seems like it has, music is something that's beyond like a physical act. There's a spiritual element to it. Well, you've opened up a whole seminar here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Part two and three. All right. Here's the headlines for, as far as I'm concerned. Music was given to us to worship God. Yes. That's the original. Now, the different doctrines of whether Satan was the worship leader in heaven yeah. or whatever before he fell, maybe you can't really prove that by Scripture, but it's possible. What is real is, though, that after he fell, he is a master at manipulating people with music. And yes. If yeah. you watch anything, like I watch the Grammys just because I need to see what's going on in the world. The Beyonce, all the uh, Cardi B stuff, it's it's just hardcore pornography in a musical form. Yes. Yeah. So the devil is an expert at corrupting the minds of youth, influencing people into if nothing else, just just being numb to God by That's right. keeping them in the world or West country music where you're empathizing with their pain, but there's no answers there. Right. So we know that side of it. So what happens when Christians get a hold of it, there's, a, there's only one element that we have. See, part of the problem is that in Christian music, contemporary Christian music, everybody's been trying to copy the world. That's right. And you'd always designate a new artist by comparing them to a worldly artist. Oh, she, yeah. she's the she Christian Madonna. Like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nobody says, oh, uh, that guy's the, the secular Phil Kage. We don't see it the other way. So the only thing we have that the world doesn't have is the anointing. That's yeah. right. We, here's what we don't have. We don't have sexuality. We can't do Tina Turner. We can't do Cardi B. We can't do those kind of lyrics. So they have a tool that we don't have, but we don't want it. Yep. Uh-huh. But it, in some ways that makes our music bland because part of what's attractive about worldly music is that it does speak of sexuality and, and, and even good songs about that. I'm yep. not talking about this is filth, but yep. good songs can have, you know, the romance and the heart and all that stuff. But what we have that they don't have is the anointing. And if you have Christian music that comes out without the anointing, then you've completely missed the boat. You know, yeah. if you uh-huh. don't, you know, you got to follow God and create the music that God tells you about. But it's very interesting how you frame the question because no one has ever asked me that before. (laughs) So what was happening up on that mountain was because I was ignorant of spirituality in the dark part of it. Yeah. You know, we knew about the devil and, you know, but we never had experience about anything like that. And so I was actually experiencing the darkness using, you know, maybe it was a chant, you know, that witches Mm -hmm. use. I don't know what I was singing. Right. And drawing demons. I think that stuff works. I think there's ways you can draw demons into a situation, you know, seances and stuff. Sure. And so then conversely, we need to draw people into the presence of God with our music. And the only thing that can do that is the anointing of God. Now, some people would argue, well, the anointing, I don't know about that. Sounds like you got a bottle of spirituality somewhere. But the anointing is just, in my definition, would be creating a vehicle musical vehicle that God can pour his spirit through to touch the hearts of someone. It's, yes. I like to emphasize to people that young musicians that music is not the ministry. You say, I'm in the music ministry. Well, what is that? You're in the ministry of using music to convey the gospel or to Amen. convey a message. Amen. That's it. And if you understand that, then um, you've got your head on straight. So how to use that in a, in a godly way is a, a real learning experience. Some of it's intuitive, but one of the things about Love Song that I think was unique and why God honored our ministry so much is that it was never about music. You know, there's one of the groups put out a, a song called God Gave Us Rock and Roll that was almost a challenge. You know, God gave us rock and roll. Don't you tell us he didn't, you know, because well, we were never in that camp. In fact, I'll tell this this little two vignettes here that go together. One is that when we play conservative audiences where we could see the people were 70 years old and they weren't going to relate to the loud drums, <laughs> we would just bring in the bongos and we'd bring in the acoustic guitars and we'd sing two hands or some of the people know our music, the more mellow music. 
because we were there to minister to them, not turn them off, not push them back. Correct. Yes. So we knew they weren't going to respond. You know, they were going to go like this or walk out of the room. So we would minister to them with music that they could relate to. And so often we had these repentance services at the end where they'd come up to us and say, oh, we misjudged you guys because of your long hair. We're so sorry. We oh, repent. Wow. God really used you. You know, it happened all the time. Then the, conversely, we would go up to Berkeley or to uh, University of Texas at Austin in the free speech areas where the SDS and uh, Abby Hoffman and the Weather Underground started with by just speaking to the students. Well, and then we pull out all the amps and we turn everything up to 12 like they did in, in uh, Spinal Tap. And <laughs> we jam for 20 minutes and draw a group of students. And then we just preach straight gospel. And that was uh, the way we used the tool of music to yes, convey yes. the gospel to them. So that's that's how I feel people, that's what I feel that people need to hear about how to use music. These young kids, they come to you and they want they want to be the next Michael W. Smith or something, and it's the wrong attitude. Yeah. So I always teach them first, I say, uh, find out your calling. You know, Tom Stipe, for instance, who was in a group called Country Faith, who was recently died. He went out and he was in that group for a couple of years, and he wound up pastoring a Calvary Chapel in Denver for most of his life, but he had a little Hammond up front and he could come in and he could play his music in church and express his gift, but he just wasn't on the road because he determined that his gifting wasn't just in music, it was as also a pastor and a teacher. So we got to properly understand our calling because music, you know, it's very attractive music. You know, I got to be in the music ministry because I play guitar, you know. Right. If that was the rule that everybody that talks should be a preacher then because you can talk. So you just need to be sure of your calling is what I call it. But um, that's part of that whole dynamic. But uh, by the way, we're doing a documentary called a band called Love Song. That's going to be the um, accurate story behind the Jesus Revolution. And it's um, it's just our band talking about our experiences and how we started. All the stuff we're talking about now, which is also in my book, Rock and Roll Preacher, available <laughs> on Amazon.com. We'll have all that in our show notes uh, for our audience. So. Yeah, so anyhow, one of the stories in the documentary that mainly Tommy tells, because he remembered in the greatest detail, but we were invited by this guy I mentioned earlier, Bob Mumford. Bob Mumford was uh, part of what became New Wine Magazine, and they had these five guys that were like, we joking, we call them the five horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> um, Don Basham and um, Bob Mumford, and um, some people remember Derek Prince, people like that, that had a certain kind of a ministry perspective. So we tell the story that Bob had invited us to go up to Oakland, where there was this meeting taking place for full gospel businessmen. It was a huge conference of all the full gospel, which for the uninitiated is one of the first fellowships specifically for businessmen, and it was founded by a guy named Dima Shikarian. So Bob says, "Let's if you guys can get up there, I'll see if we can get you to play. Well, the guy that was running the meeting wasn't into us at all. In fact, we... We jokingly called him Oil Can Harry or Snidely Whiplash or something because <laughs> he was real rude to us, you know. No way you're playing, you know, because you're hippies. A yeah. lot of it was. Yeah. So Bob went over his head, I guess, to Demas, and he said, these guys are anointed, and, you, you know, I've heard them, and they're going to be well-received. So he gets permission to have us play, and he tells Oil Can Harry, <laughs> and he reluctantly agrees because he pretty much has to. Yep. So we're getting ready to go on stage, and he grabs Tommy by the arm, and he says, one song, no talking. <laughs> so we're kind of trembling going on stage. We don't know what to do. We were babies at this. We hadn't done anything like this. And so we sing Welcome Back Again, I think. And you can see like a ripple. The Holy Spirit moved through the crowd, and they're all just like starting to respond to the song. And by the end of the song, the Holy Spirit had fallen on the whole place. Now... Oil can Harry's there with the <laughs> microphone. Oh, tell us your testimony, young man, you know, because he recognized that God yeah. really used our group. So yep. we had a lot of experiences like that because we were we were one of the first hippie bands to go out, you know, and these kind of repentance services were were regular. And I just love how God loves to confound the world by using the things that other people don't find value in, right? Like the mm -hmm. organized church didn't find value in hippies, but God chose to use hippies Amen. to bring a new move of the Holy Spirit. 
um, into people's lives. And I, I, we could probably spend another three hours talking out through hi- the history of what God did through the, you know, the worship ministry, but you know, we don't have the time for that. We'll have links on our show notes for your book, for the upcoming documentary. In fact, when is that scheduled to release? We're hoping to get it out. April 24 is our goal because we okay. run into all kinds of situations with legal right now, clearing all the oh, right, yeah. shortage sure. in the photographs. Yep, that sure. takes and a long then, time. Uh, I'm doing a, my first solo album with musicians in 30 years Okay, called uh, Moonrise Serenade. That comes out. As soon as I get it done, hopefully okay. by the end of the year. Okay. And those are the two things on the back burner yeah. right now. Nice. Before we started recording, you were telling me about a YouTube video where you and, Ch- and the band members and Chuck Smith spend about three hours or so talking about the history of the of Love Song and the, and the Jesus movement. Could you just elaborate on that? What sure. was that about? The backstory to that very quickly is that Chuck Calvary bought our catalog back from a publishing company that wasn't really interested in re-release and he said since we got all your stuff back you want to go on the road again so we agreed and um, we started going out with Chuck Smith in 2010 and um, we would compare stories on the road and they'd always be a little different because you know we'd say well we remember when we first came there this happened and he said well I remember when you guys walked in and the same story but from his perspective so I thought wouldn't this be interesting to get this on tape so I arranged to get Love Song and Chuck Smith on the platform at Calvary. They and they had a director guy that used to do their services to to switch cameras and things. We didn't have a crew there or anything, but uh, you could have a little camera angle action there. And all we did was it was not planned, scripted at all. We just started off with some question, and then we would talk about our side of it, and then Chuck would chime in, tell his side of it, and we went on for three and a half hours with it, the camera roll. Well, I didn't know what to do with it. It was I'd put it together, and I ostensibly I owned the footage, and I yeah. thought I don't know if I'm ever going to edit this down. Uh, this is so we need to at least get it up on YouTube, so yeah. it's yeah. available. So we did. We put it up. I think if you put in oral history, Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith love song, something like that. Oral history would be the key word that should come up, and it's very interesting. Wow. It's very firsthand, it's spontaneous, you know, there's uh, the real story, uh, another part of the real story of the Jesus Revolution. Awesome. Yeah, yeah well, I'll, I'll definitely find that, and that'll also be in our show notes. I'd like to get two more minutes of just mopping something up. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. Just a real quick little history of what happened after we started playing at Calvary, because it's important how this thing all burgeoned from there and moved out into the nation, is that, uh, first of all, Love Song began to get invitations to play other churches and we were a little conflicted about that but chuck said this is part of the deal then we went on a national tour um but the thing i wanted to really get into the podcast here today or at least get it on tape was expo 72 which a lot of younger christians don't know older christians don't know about it and it was a sort of a woodstock gathering of christians with about eighty-five thousand people in dallas texas in the cotton bowl at night but 130,000 on the parkway during the day to hear people like Johnny Cash and Chris Christopherson, people who were considered to be Christian, celebrity Christians of the day, along with a lot of the hippie bands like ourselves, Children of the Day, Barry McGuire, Larry Norman, and some some regular bands that weren't hippie bands, Christian bands. So um, this was a, a, a huge event, and people came from all over the world, and one of the big questions on the hearts of all Christians throughout the world was, are hippies really saved? because they didn't they thought if you got saved you'd shave your beard and you'd look like us and yep. we'd think if you got saved you'd be a hippie like us you know it was like <laughs> two way street there and so it was the first time this gathering of people from all over the world had heard hippies play and on Friday night in the Cotton Bowl we did a set and right after we played Billy Graham got up and spoke and I actually wow. marked that as a a turning point a paradigm shift in Christian music where people that were a little on the fence opened their idea, the idea to drums, guitars, and church. See, we've we've harnessed the culture at other seasons. The, the, the rumor is, I don't know if it's ever been fu- fundamentally proven, but Mighty Fortresses Our God was a beer hall drinking song. That's right. And you can hear the Germans, you know, <laughs> in the beer hall. With their, <laughs> they're holding their, their steins of beer. And then he wrote Christian lyrics and created one of the greatest hymns. 
of all time. But here's the difference. Rock and roll always had a dirty reputation because of they thought Elvis Presley's lewd gestures and yep. it was the music of rebellion. It was music we liked more because it was great music, but we liked it more because our parents hated it. And so people couldn't see how it could be redeemed. Right. And what we demonstrated that night, and we continued to do so, I think I covered it earlier about how we would be sensitive to older audiences, was to show people how to, you know, not just that night, but continue to see how to use music as a tool and how to use rock and roll in a way that Holy Spirit could use it. So Amen. that was, to me, an important story and a paradigm shift within Christian music that I really do. I've talked to people that were there like mm -hmm. 20 years later, and they said, our church was never the same. We came back, and we had changed our mind about so many things, and mm -hmm. then we put drums in church, and we got some guys to play guitars because everyone was shying away because rock and roll was supposed to be the music of rebellion. Yeah, so right. we showed them how it could be the music of the Holy Spirit. I love Amen. it. That's yeah. yes. The business of Jesus is yes. redemption. Amen. Right? It takes what the world uh, thinks is filth, and, and he, including us, right? That was me. Right. And he redeems us and he sanctifies us and he makes us holy. And uh, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Chuck, thank you so much. I, I know we can spend several hours, you know, from from our perspective. I mean, it's just been like a sponge to hear sort of the story behind the story. Right. And and that is the Christian life. There's always a story behind the story. And and so thank you so much for sharing your story. The foundation of Jesus in My Life podcast comes from the story in Luke chapter eight, where Jesus comes to a man who had been cast out of society because he was demon possessed. And he, he was so crazy. He was excluded and he was broken. He was, he was in bondage and Jesus comes and literally saves him, heals him, delivers him in, in the name of Christ. And at that moment of salvation, and his awakening and being born again, he says to Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus says to him, I want you to follow me in a way that I've got an assignment. I want you to go back to your family and tell them what I've done for you. And what's amazing about this, and we say this almost all, regularly after every uh, podcast episode, is this man goes above and beyond and he goes beyond his family and he goes to the whole town sharing about what Christ has done. And to hear your story before Christ and all those, you know, instances mm -hmm. of how, you know, the love of Christ just drew you in and, and then to where things are today, you have done that today. Thank you for sharing your story. Pleasure. And I know that it's going to bless all those who, who listen. Chuck, it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes. Thank you, Chuck. Everybody else, stay tuned for new episodes every Tuesday. God bless. Thank you for listening to Jesus in My Life. New episodes release every Tuesday. Subscribe on your preferred podcasting platform so you don't miss a single episode. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please consider sharing this podcast with a friend or family member. If you would like to help our visibility online, consider rating us and posting a review on Apple Podcast. Have an awesome Jesus in My Life story? Contact us at JesusInMyLifePodcast at gmail.com.